So we're going to be starting a new series right now today in Colossians. So we're going to have our scripture reading from Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, we are not going to have the slides on the TVs for you, okay? So we're pivoting. So if you don't have a Bible, grab one, then the seat in front of you so you can read along with us. And if you do have a Bible, start bringing it because uh, we, we're, we're pivoting to not have the main text. We'll have the supporting scriptures up there, but the main text is Colossians 1. You can find it on page 987, 987 in the Pew Bible, Colossians 1. But we want you guys to be in your word, uh, write in it, highlight in it, pray through it, have it on your lap. And if you don't have a Bible, just take one of ours today, please. We want you to have one. We'll, we'll buy more. But we want you guys to just live and breathe and just be in these thing, uh, this, this living, breathing word. Every word of it's true. I stand here as a witness before you to say that. And uh, so, yeah, 987 today. And uh, Dan's going to be reading whenever you're ready, brother. All right, this reading is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the church in Colossus, beginning in chapter 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. And from our brother Timothy, we are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossus who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God, our Father, give you grace and peace. We always pray for you and give thanks to you, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This is the same good news that came to you going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives just as it changed your life in the first day you heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. Mm -hmm. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he's helping us on our behalf. He has told us about the love for your others of the Holy Spirit that has given you. Mm -hmm. So we have not stopped praying for you ever since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor, honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father, he has enabled you to share the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks, be to God. Thanks brother. Go Bears. Uh, I, I want you to kind of imagine a scenario with me. It's just this frame this morning. I want you to imagine for a second. We, you know, we've been talking about a couple weeks back, uh, you know, that, we're, that God's invited us to be playmakers in his kingdom and all that. I want, to, I want you to imagine that that's been happening in your life, and maybe it actually is. That you've got a friend that you've been growing a relationship with, and through that relationship, maybe you've been spending more time together, having some fun together, going out to lunch or whatever. Maybe it's a friend from work or your neighborhood, and, and that friendship's gotten to a point where they start asking you, like, hey, you know, I, I know you're involved in church or whatever. Like, tell me about that. How'd that start? I, you don't strike me as someone that's religious or whatever, and you say, yeah, you know, I started my relationship with Jesus, and this is what life used to look like, and this is what it looks like now. And, you know, you're just kind of, you're just sharing life with them. Hey, this is the hope that I have. This is what the gospel is. And so they're like, yeah, I, I love that. I, and so they become a Christian. They surrender their life to Christ. But the relationship pivots a little bit. They have to move. They have to, they have to move. So there's a sick member of their family. They, they have to relocate their family to go be with a parent or however the story goes. I'm just making this up. You know? So, But you, they move away, and, and you come to find out they move to a place where there's no other Christians. And there's no other Christians in their family. They're the only one. But, you know, your friend's reading the Bible and spending some time together. They make friends, and next thing you know, there's a few people gathering around reading the Bible, and then a few people get saved, and now you've got a little church that's started in this living room, and this little Bible study turns into more people getting saved. And next thing you know, your friend comes to visit you, and is like, I haven't seen you in a couple years, but, man, I've got all these people at my house. I've got, like, a full church is going, and what do I do? You know, what do I, what do I say to them? I mean, things are going well, but... Some things are not going so well. I mean, there's some people, they used to be part of some cults and weird stuff, and they're starting to bring and ask us to do some stuff that I'm not comfortable with. And 
We got some other people bringing in some other beliefs. I'm not sure that, that really works either. Like, how, what do I do? Well, that, that's actually very similar to the situation we're about to enter into to Colossians. But the question I have for you is, if your friend came asking you, hey, can you just send a letter back to my church and, and help me with all this stuff, what would you write? Like, what would you write? A little fledgling church, you know, and, and there's some problems coming into it, but a lot of things are going well. What would you, what would you write? Keep the main thing the main thing. It's a great place to start. And you might even be thinking, like, what, what would even be some of the first few sentences that I would want to say? And that's, that's what we get to look at this morning, just the first few sentences. I mean, like Sarah just said, you would want to probably put the most prioritized things at the beginning. You want to say, hey, here's some things that you should probably root your life in if you're going to have success as a church. And that's what we get in Colossians 1. Paul's trying his best to communicate to a church that he's actually never even been to physically some of the core foundations of what they need to know about living this life with Jesus, about being a Christian. And so this letter that we're about to dive into over the next seven weeks, this letter is trying to help them both grow in wisdom and maturity but also do a little bit of of guarding against some of the false teachings that were starting to infiltrate the church. We already looked at that a bit in Acts, where this was happening. But in Colossae, there were were pagans, so Greco-Roman pagans that were getting saved that were becoming part of the church. And you've got former Jews that are now coming to the church, all becoming one family in Christ. And each of them's kind of bringing in some baggage, that we would call it. And there's even some newer Near Eastern cults that are starting to say, yeah, Jesus was a great start, but once you're done with him, you can get off with some of the, the real learning. And so he's going to address some of those things, coach them, warn them. But most of all, and we're going to see here, he's going to try to root them in. He's going to try to root them into the core foundations of walking with Jesus. And I couldn't help uh, but think of Psalm chapter 1 this week as I was reading over these particular verses. Uh, Psalm 1, the psalmist paints this picture of a tree planted by a river. Uh, I'll I'll read it with you. I I think this is profound because, I mean, the the Psalter, all the psalms in there, and and this is the first one. Psalm 1, verse 1, it says this. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They, speaking of people, are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season, and their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. The psalm starts out by sort of painting the imagery of what a person who's going to flourish looks like. That, That like a tree planted by a river, when our roots grow down into it, we're able to flourish. And actually, in chapter three, Paul's going to use that, those exact languages that you rooted into Christ. What I love about this is that it, I love how the Bible is so real about life. It, never, it doesn't say, you, you know, you root yourselves in and everything goes well. So it's not that when there's scorching heat and there's freezing cold, you won't wither. You, you won't die. You won't become uprooted. I just love it. It's not, not masking that pain's going to happen or circumstances are going to change. It's saying, no, but when you're rooted into God, that your life won't wither. It's going to bear fruit in each season. And here Paul's echoing the, the psalmist and saying, I think to the Colossians and to us today, that when you root your lives into Jesus, the true and better river, the river of living water, when you root into him, you won't wither. You, you'll, you'll be able to bear fruit in each season. And I don't know about you guys, but I really like the sound of that promise. I far too easily feel uprooted, tossed around by the winds of teaching and news and family drama and whatever, and way too easily feel like I'm just about to topple over. I f- way too easily feel susceptible to the heat or the cold or a metaphor you prefer of life. I want to be rooted in. And so I think Paul speaks to not just the Colossian church, to us today, saying if you want to know what that's like, listen to how I address the Colossian church. So let's, let's look at these together because what he does is he says if you want a rooted life, you want to root your life in faith, hope, and love. It's really funny that Paul, I mean, we, it, it sounds like a, some like sign you buy at Target or whatever for your house, faith, hope, love. You know, it's just, I, I mean, like the, our culture has borrowed Christian terms but then like just removes Christ from it. It's faith, hope, love. Well, what the heck is that? 
Well, Paul's like, actually, those are legitimate, and those are themes he brings up over and over in his letters, faith, hope, and love. But he says a rooted life is actually a byproduct of faith, hope, and love. So that's what we're going to look at, and I'm going to start with love first because that's where Paul starts, Colossians 1.1. Here we go. This is a letter from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ and from our brother Timothy. So he's introducing himself, his role as an apostle. Verse 2, we're writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May our God, our Father, give you grace and peace. Same father, same family. Verse 3, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love, you can underline love here, for all of God's people. You skip to verse 7, it says, you learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, so here they're vouching for Epaphras, he's legit. And he is helping us on your behalf. In verse 8, he has told us about, there it is again, the love. He told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So let me pause and do a little contextual work here. Paul is writing to Colossae, this church that's there. He's never been there himself, but he's writing not only him, but Timothy's with him. And at this point, he's in jail. There's some debate if he's in jail in Rome or in Ephesus. And to me, I don't think it really matters at all because he's in jail either way, and he's writing a letter to people he hasn't met. So I don't think it changes the context at all. But he's writing with Timothy. Timothy, when we were going through Acts, we saw it. Paul met Timothy in Lystra in Acts chapter 16, and and Timothy had gotten saved, responded to the gospel message, and then becomes one of Paul's traveling companions on his missionary journeys. They become best buddies, and he's going with them all over the place. And as they're in jail, at some point, they hear from Epaphras. It's, it's most likely that Epaphras was also met by Paul and Timothy during their time in Ephesus. In Acts, they spend at least a few years in Ephesus as kind of their hub of ministry for what we would call now modern-day Turkey, or they call it you know, Asia Minor, if you want to use that term. At some point, Epaphras had gotten saved in Ephesus and then went back home to Colossae. It's about 100 miles east of Ephesus. And this was what happened in Ephesus and a lot of the cities that Paul and them would set up shop in. People would come. They hear about this thing, the way of Jesus and all that. They'd come. They'd listen to Paul. They'd get saved, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they'd go back to these little towns and places all over the world, and they would start sharing that good news. And next thing you know, Churches are planted, and you see the global church as it is today in many ways. And so this church that Epaphras had helped start, maybe whether intentionally or not, he's now looks like the, the pastor of this church, and it's made up of both, like as I said, former pagans and, and former Jews, but they're now one family in Christ. And what's cool about this beginning part is whatever Epaphras has shared with, with Paul and Timothy about the church in Colossae, one of the things that he has shared is that they have tremendous love for their brothers and sisters in Christ. That's like the indicative thing about this group of people. He says in verse 4, we have heard, which obviously Epaphras has shared with them, of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people. And then in verse 8, he says, he has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. And so Paul, right out the gate, is affirming them, encouraging them. He's saying, hey, look, we're so stoked when we hear about you guys. And you know what we're really stoked about is the love that you guys have for other brothers and sisters in Christ. I wish I knew exactly what the report was. What were they doing to demonstrate this? But I can imagine it was what would come to our minds, like serving people, helping people, taking care of widows and orphans and sharing each other, kind of what we see in Acts chapter 2. But Paul goes even further and he says, the love that you have is proof, quote, that the Holy Spirit has given you this. So it's not even a love that they have just inherent. It's actually, a, it's actually a fruit of the fact that their lives are rooted in Christ and they have union with Christ. What are they doing out there? That's hilarious. <laughs> They're excited about their union with Jesus. Uh, but he's saying, hey, there's fruit. You guys love people. And what's cool is it's, it's an already thing. They already have it. He's affirming them. Hey, you, you guys, you, you, we can see this is legitimate. Your church is legitimate. We recognize that as apostles. And they're celebrating that. But here's what's somewhat tragic about this, is that unfortunately, I know far too many people, and sometimes that person is the one looking at me in the mirror, that knows a lot about the Bible and a lot about Christian things, goes to a lot of Sunday gatherings and Bible studies and all that, and they're missing love for people. I mean, this is one of the most tragic and shocking things in my experience as a Christian is that you can have people that know so much, apparently, about the Bible, and yet when it comes to other people, there's a, 
an absence of love. It's, it's scary, honestly. So it's probably the biggest critique that the world has of the church is, wait a minute, how do you know all that, and yet you don't seem to love people? What, what's going on? Well, because Jesus said, if you remember Luke chapter, or, sorry, Mark 12, hey, even I need my notes. Mark 12, somebody asked him, what's the most important command? And he says, Jesus says, the most important command sums up all the law and the prophets is love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then John, in his later letters, 1 John 3, says, if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we've passed from death to life. But a person who has no love is still dead. And obviously that doesn't mean physically dead because they're alive, but spiritually they're dead. He goes on in verse 16 of that third chapter. He says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So like Jesus actually defines what love is. He gave up his life up for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And what John does here, and I think this is great, I, I say this at weddings all the time, love is not an emotion only. It's an action. Like love is not a metaphorical, just a feeling that we have, but it's actually an act. And Jesus redefines love. He says, actually, it's an act of self-sacrifice for the benefit of someone else. That's love. It's both, but never just one of those. And, and then he goes on chapter 4 of 1 John. says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God. Right. For God is love. And there's where it breaks down. You can know a lot about the Bible and know a little bit about Jesus, if not nothing. I have a, a friend, a therapist, Christian therapist, and uh, he'll get his, his counselors all together, and they'll debrief, and they'll do trainings. But the question that he asks when they get together every time, I heard this, it never left my mind, I heard this years ago, when he gets them together, he says, how have you grown in love for others since the last time we met? Let's go around and talk about that. Like the, the litmus test of their maturity and their growth is, how have you grown in love for others? Oh, when you start asking yourself that question, maybe you can ask it of yourself right now. How have I grown in love for others in the last year, last month? That's, that's a, man, I think I might have... Actually, I think I might have gone down. I think I love people less than that now than a year ago, possibly. But what, what Paul's argument is, is a rooted life is a life that's rooted in love. And, you know, I think our new age of friends would actually be totally in agreement with me up until right now, this sermon, because John keeps going. He says, because that's a big new age verse right there, that any, love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who doesn't love doesn't know God. It's like, oh, you know, like, I think like a lot of religions would say that, right? Like, yeah, love, God. Okay, yeah, that seems to make sense. Here's what's different, verse 9. God showed how much he loved us. This is what God means by love. That he sent his one and only son into the world that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice. There it is again, laying your life down, to take away our sins. That's real love. This is the Christian definition of love. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. And there it is. You can only give something that you have received. And when it comes to love, you don't just say, like, oh, I feel so bad. I don't love people. And my, and say, no, he's, what he's saying is, no, if you want love, receive it. You, you can't give what you don't have. And if you're rooted into the love of Jesus that he has for you, then and only then can you give it away. The real metric, if you've said to yourself, I don't love people more as I'm saying that, I've decreased in love, I've decreased in the intake of love. That's the real issue. And this is the observation number one for this morning. Love for others, the fruit of being rooted, is the fruit of being rooted in the love Jesus has for you. I just want to say, I think at Generation Church, this has to be our definition of maturity. It can't just be, I think Bible knowledge, obviously, I wouldn't be teaching it, is incredible and helpful and important. But if our definition of growth and maturity and discipleship is not a growth in love, we're going to mess it. And what's so weird is that you can sit in church conferences and all that stuff, 
and how do they measure measure health? And it's like growth. It's like how many more people do you have sitting in the room and what's going on? How many times do you serve the neighborhood? And that's all good. But if we don't love people, if I don't, it's easy to do this job and, and then make it seem like I'm loving. A lot of guys on stage that are real good at preaching really whatever important messages, probably even true messages. You could do this job without loving people. Right. Easily. You could love yourself and just love the people listening to you. But I don't want that. I don't want that for you either. I want our metric of maturity to be that we actually, we love people. And we know we love them. Why? Because we want to lay our lives down the way he laid his life down for us. But Paul doesn't just leave us with love. He says if your life's going to be rooted, it's rooted in love and it's rooted in hope. That's where he goes next. Verse 4 says, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people, which come from, even ties love to your confident hope. Underline that, your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. And you have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Verse 6, this same good news, which is really important, it's not like there's gospel here, but then they changed it a little bit, now it's a gospel over here. And this is what, no, no, it's like the same good news you heard is the same one that's going out all over the world, and it's bearing fruit. The gospel bears fruit. And it's changing lives just as it changed your life from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. The same good news. Friends, we heard the same good news that they heard, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In our place, the, his life, perfect life lived for us, the death we deserve that he took, and his resurrection, which gives us resurrection life now and forever. But what's cool about this for me is that at some point, what Epaphras was sharing is clear that he was making sure that they were rooted in the future component of the gospel, though. He said, when you first heard the truth of the good news, what I mean by that is the, the gospel that he was sharing was not only a message about what Christ had done, it was also a message about what Christ was doing, so the gospel was bearing fruit everywhere, and specific to this point, it was what the gospel would accomplish, what Christ was yet to do but is going to do. This is really cool because the gospel is all of those things, by the way. It's the good news of the past. We can have confident hope. As we're going to see in a minute, we read that the gospel was bearing, uh, sorry, he purchased our freedom in verse 13. He redeemed us. Those are all past tense things. That's true. That's all Christ has done. But it was also the good news of what he's doing right now. We talk about that a lot here. But what, what Paul is recognizing in them, he says that from the first time you heard it, you have had confident hope in what God has reserved for you in heaven. He's calling them back to that. He even says your expectation. So it's, it's not just like a, a pipe dream, ah, oh, yeah, one day. He's saying, no, you have an expectation and a confidence of what's reserved for you, that the best is yet to come. And that's actually backfilling your love for people now. And Peter does the same thing. This isn't just something that Paul does. Peter, in his letter to the church in Asia Minor, a similar region, writes in 1 Peter 1, 3, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And now we live with, there it is again, the great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. The rooted life is a life rooted in the love of Jesus and the hope of Jesus of the future. And I just want to confess, I, I think I have swam in theological waters for most of my ministry experience, which kind of like poo-pooed heaven a little bit. It's like, oh, heaven. Yeah, I know. I know. But like the, guy, the real work is right here right now, you know, and, and let's missiology, ecclesiology. It's, it's all these things, you know, it's loving people right in front of us. And I agree. That's actually all true. <laughs> all those things are true. And there are good things. We need to celebrate what God is doing right now. I mean, it, but we can start to critique, and I started to do this. I'm just confessing what I went to. I started to critique, and even you hear that phrase, like, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You ever heard that one? Yeah. But, I, but I think what Peter and Paul would argue back, and Jesus would probably argue back, is unless you're heavenly minded, you can't be earthly good. Like, 
there is something about the fact that we have eternal hope of glory with God forever and peace coming that, that backfills and informs the way we live life right now. True. And the best part of it is we don't have to choose some weird false dichotomy that you can't be heavenly minded and earthly good. That's a false dichotomy. It's in the gospel, we get all three. The gospel is past, present, and future. It's the past. Jesus Christ saved us from the penalty of sin. It's the present gospel. Jesus actively saving people in the world, working through us, in us, never giving up on us, union with him right now and future. The best is yet to come. Everything we long for is going to happen one day. Joy, life, love, glory, peace, we will experience uninterrupted forever and ever with him. And I think, I'm, and I'm speaking on your behalf, but I think most of us don't allow ourselves to meditate on that reality enough. I think we're far under water in that plot of grass right there. I'd ask you this. Do you, do you ever let yourself meditate on the beauty of eternal hope? It's not pie in the sky wishful thinking. Paul and Peter are arguing, actually, you need to do that if you're going to live faithfully now because that's actually reality. They, and they were actually, Paul's arguing that if you're rooted in eternal hope, it's actually going to help you love people now because you're not trying to get everything you can out of this life extracted of this little piece of the puzzle. You've got eternity in mind. And that makes sense to me that actually by having future hope, I would have present hope. Because when you, if you're a sports fan like I am, if you know the final score, it totally changes emotionally the way you watch the game. <laughs> if, 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 you're a, if you're an arts fan, if you know the end of the movie, the sad scenes where it looks like the bad guy's winning just don't bother you that much. You're like, oh, you're about to get it, though. Laugh now. And, and this brings to mind this, this story that Larry Osborne put in his book, Thriving in Babylon. Uh, he He's a, uh, he's a USC fan, so we can pray for that brother, intercede on his behalf, that the Lord might meet him and call him to repentance. But anyways, they got their, their butts beat last night by Notre Dame, go Irish. And, um, but it wasn't always that way. Sorry, Trojan fans. Uh, not so sorry, but anyways. Uh, in 2005, USC was the number one rated team in the nation. Uh, they had multiple Heisman Trophy winners on that team. They were rated number one. We, the Irish, were, were number nine. They came to our house, the South Bend, to play. Uh, it, was a, it was just a, a meeting. It was, it was going to be a battle. And Notre Dame came out, jumped all over them, and USC was down. And actually, Notre Dame scored with about two minutes left to go up, and we kicked it off. And they were, like, thinking, okay, well, not looking too good. Maybe we'll run the kickback. Maybe, well, it doesn't go good because we kick it off, and we nail their guy on, like, the 15-yard line. And then the next play drops back the pass, and Liner gets sacked. One of our guys breaks through, and then... And, and the Notre Dame fans are going crazy. And this is where I'll pick up what Larry wrote as a, a, a <laughs> tragic USC fan here. He says, the Notre Dame crowd went crazy. And the Irish players chest bumped. Their goofy leprechaun mascot was cartwheeling across the field. I lost my sanctification. <laughs> to this day, I can't get that play out of my head. And I can't watch it without reaching for the remote. But it's not to change the channel. It's to hit pause and then play it back in slow motion. I want to see where the blocking broke down. I want to understand why Leinart failed to find an open receiver. But most of all, I want to take in the unmitigated joy and passion of the Notre Dame players and fans as they celebrate. I count the chest bumps. I count the leprechaun's cartwheels. And then I watch it again. Not because I'm a masochist. Not because I'm a good loser. But because I know how the game ends. I know that two plays after being sacked, Leinart will throw a miraculous fourth down 61-yard pass to Dwayne Jarrett. And I know that as time runs out, he'll sneak across the goal line with a little help from Reggie Bush and what will go down in USC lore is the Bush push. In other words, I know that the good guys win, or at least my good guys, and that changes everything. The same plays that once caused me to yell at the TV, toss the remote, and utter Christian euphemisms no longer faze me. A Notre Dame touchdown in the waning moments is no big deal. A devastating 10-yard sack is not so devastating. They just make the miracle ending all the better. And then it hit me. Don't we claim to know how the game of life ends? And if we do, shouldn't that affect the way we interpret and respond to the enemy's short-term victories and temporary advances? Yes. If our sins are forgiven and our destiny is assured, 
If we are joint heirs with Jesus and certain he's coming back to set all wrongs right, then despair and panic over the latest court decision or even the steady erosion of morality in our culture or our family problems or problems in the world hardly seem like appropriate responses. Friends, we know the final score. And I hate to use that a metaphor, for, a sports metaphor for that because this is going to be so much more beautiful. Brothers and sisters, I, mean, I just invite you to embrace your eternal hope. It's more real than you sitting in this room. We can have confidence and expectancy that the day of peace is coming, that all you long for will be experienced in a fullness beyond what you can expect, that your aches, your pains, dislocated shoulders, <laughs> they all stop. Death stops. Sadness, as J.R.R. Tolkien said, everything sad will become untrue. This is what's awaiting us. The best is yet to come. And that car, that's our second observation, is that eternal hope in Jesus produces a rooted life. I also recognize that there's some of you in here that, that don't have that, that you, you don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, and, and so your hope just ebbs and flows with how circumstances are going. I just want to say you can get off that roller coaster at any time by just saying Jesus Save me. Like, I, I just surrender my life to you. That, that's all it takes. It's just a, a prayer. He knows your heart. He's the most interested party in, in your salvation. To say, save me, Lord, get me off this. I want to just have hope in you and you alone by what you've done, not what I'm doing. And get off that roller coaster. Just surrender at any time because in Christ, as Peter said, there is wonderful joy ahead. Even though we will suffer for a little while. I love the reality of the Bible. It's like, look, there is joy coming, but we're, Let's play no games. Like, we will suffer a little while. And I love how he says, in light of eternity, it's just a little while. And so that's what Paul's doing. He's rooting this church in love. He's rooting them in hope. And lastly is the faith part. In verse 9, he says, we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. And we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding in other words, hey, I know there's other things creeping in, you know, magic eight balls and little seances and ascetic practices, certain fastings and festivals that you need to go to, and then, then you'll finally know God. And he's saying, no, no, everything you need, God has. You don't need to do any crazy rituals. Just, just ask him for it, and he'll give it to you. Then verse 10, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better, that relational intimacy. Verse 11, we also pray that you'll be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. The last part of this intro, this prayer that he's saying, he's praying for me, he says, I just want to root you in faith. And, and by faith, I don't mean what, like, a lot, of, a lot of times we hear that word, gosh, it's just lost so much significance. We hear faith, and it's like, oh, I just hope things will work out. You know, like, that's what most people think. Just have faith. Like, oh, you know, they jump up, just jump. And it's not religious wishful thinking. Faith is not crossing your fingers and just hoping something will happen. Faith is what Hebrews 1, 11 says. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. Or some old translation you might have memorized it, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. It's, it's a confidence that God's going to come through. It's not just, it's, it's like confidence that God's going to do exactly what he says he's going to do. Right. And how do you get that level of expectation? Well, you experience it, but, you know, in construction, when I was a, a general contractor, we'd, we'd solicit bids and all those things, and we'd evaluate, and then we'd get evaluated by the Department of Defense on if they wanted to award us contracts. The major thing that would get you the job or not was past performance, because past performance is the best indic indicator of future performance. If you've stunk it up on all these jobs and everyone sued you and you change ordered them to death, you're not getting that job. But if you've done well over and over and over again, you're getting the job. And we know this just relationally. If I need help, and the person I'm always calling for help and asking for help is always flaking on me, eventually, I'm just not reaching out to them anymore. You know, it's like I have this one friend, Travis. He's the best. He always shows up when one of our other friends is going to move. You know that friend? <laughs> Everybody else has got plans. 
and like, oh, yeah, I got things to do, bro. I'd love to help you, but no, dude. Because <laughs> helping people move is horrible. <laughs> uh, and I'm busy, by the way, if you need help. There's a lot of things, a lot of things going on. But you, know, you, got, you got friends that are just people in your life that just, they just flake. Every time you need it, they flake. But you've also got other friends, like my buddy Travis. Every time you seem to be in a crisis, they show up. Not only do they show up, they show up self-sacrificially. There are a lot of things they could have been doing or at great cost to themselves, and they show up. And Paul's like, if you're going to have faith, that's what I'm talking about. Active trust, because they've shown up. And Jesus, he says, is the one that will always show up, who has always been showing up. And he starts to unpack his past performance and says, look, you can have confidence. You can have expectation, that being a key word, because he is going to show up. Look what he's done. Verse 12, he's enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people. He enabled you. You didn't enable yourself. He enabled you. Verse 13, he rescued you out of the kingdom of darkness. When you couldn't rescue yourself, he transferred us into his kingdom. Here's the big one. Verse 14, he purchased our freedom with his blood. He re- that's where we get the word redemption. He redeemed us. And then verse 15, he forgave our sins. It's what Paul writes to the Roman church in, in chapter 8, 32. If, if he gave us his son, wouldn't he freely give us all things? So he's going to show up, he's going to show up, he's going to show up, self-sacrifice, self-sacrifice. And then when you need him, he's like, oh, can't do it, sorry. <laughs> no, no, look what he's done. You want faith. Go, look, d- shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. What's he going to do next? Probably show up. This is what he does. This is the character of Jesus. And if you're going to root your, if you're going to have faith, if you're going to have expectation, this is the type of expectation you can have in Jesus. This is the type of God that he is, the one that shows up. And everybody has circumstantial moments of hope, circumstantial moments of love or faith or whatever. But in Jesus, you get unwavering, unwavering commitment to love and faith and hope because he's always going to do it. And I think what he's telling the Colossian church, and I think he would tell us today is, you don't have to look around. Stop listening to all these little things that come your way and these different teachings. Look, don't, don't look around. Look deeper. Don't, don't look around. Just look closer at Jesus. You don't need to tinker with that stuff. He's got everything you need, and he and only he is the only one that's never going to let you down. He's not going to quit on you, specifically in your time of need. And he won't even quit on you if you quit on him. It says in 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. It's not about your faithfulness. It's about the faithfulness of Jesus in your place. And a rooted life, this is our third observation, faith in Jesus produces a rooted life. Faith in Jesus. Past, present, future. He's got you. And if you allow your roots to grow down deep into that river, into his presence, thanking him for all he's done, thanking him for what he's doing right now, that you have union with him, that he loves you, thanking him for what he's going to do, that becomes root. It doesn't matter how hot it gets, how cold it gets, whatever's going on around you, you've got roots into the river of living water. And friends, as I said before, that same gospel good news that the Colossians heard is the same good news we're hearing today and have been hearing for the last 2,000 years. Verse 6, the same good news that came to you is the same good news going on all over the world, and it's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood, and here's the word, the truth, the truth, not deception, the truth about God's wonderful grace that we continue to be thankful and grateful for God's wonderful grace. And uh, grace, another one of those wor- religious words that people don't know what it means. It's the unmerited favor. Like you didn't merit favor from God, but Jesus Christ merited it in your place, and now you get favor from God that you don't deserve. Unmerited. That even though, and this is the cross, that even though we were unloving, even though we gave up hope, even though we were faithless, Jesus Christ, the perfect holy one, on the cross was treated as if he was the unloving one. If he was the faithless one, so that we, the faithless, could be called the holy ones of God, the holy people. So that we, the faithless, could be called faithful. So that we, the unliving, could be looked at by the Father and be called the loving ones. We were unloving, but he loved us. And he washed us of our sin. We had no hope, but he gave us hope by bringing us in. We had no faith, but he was faithful in our place. And now he has anchored us by his grace to himself. We are his enemies as we're about to see. 
but he made us his friends. We ran, but he ran after us and welcomed us home and seated us at his table. This is the character of Jesus. And not only did he just seat us, he actually came to reside in us. And, and what Paul prays is that they would be filled with the glorious, unlimited resources that we would experience by union with him. <laughs> Past, present, and if that weren't good enough, future. He assures us an eternity with him, with no more pain, no more death, where evil doesn't get the final word, no more tears, but with him. Love, life, joy, peace, forever and ever and ever. May we, brothers and sisters, be rooted in nothing else but Jesus. Let's pray. As Paul prayed for the Church of Colossians, I pray now, Lord, that we would overflow with gratitude and thankfulness. It seems only appropriate we close with a song called Jesus, Thank You. And that's what we do, Lord. We thank you for what you've done. Thank you for all that you've done, Lord Jesus. We could spend the rest of our lives just rehearsing and recounting all the things, just even each of us in our own personal life. might bear fruit but they would be free